Welcome to Bottom Line, a weekly look at the politics and public policy impacts on North Carolina businesses. Joining us for a review of the news of the week are Sugata Mukherjee, the editor of the Triangle Business Journal, Corey Swanson, president and CEO of the John Locke Foundation, and Jake Parker, assistant general counsel and state legislative director for the North Carolina Farm Bureau. Jake, why don't you start us off this week and talk a little bit about what's going on that impacts agribusiness here in North Carolina. Thanks, Joe. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. Uh, as the state legislative director for North Carolina Farm Bureau, I've been working at the General Assembly this week, and the most notable news there is that the state Senate just passed the North Carolina Farm Act, it's S-615. It's a bill that uh, the General Assembly has enacted over the last several years in order to reduce regulations, give more clear rules to farmers. So that passed with a unanimous vote, which is remarkable in itself and bills on the way to the House. So that was the big issue coming out of the legislature for farmers. What, what's contained in that specifically of interest? Sure, there's some uh, tax changes that just clarify a couple rules, but there's primarily some, some issues relating to county zoning. North Carolina farms are exempt from county zoning, but there's some questions about agritourism and how when you're putting a wedding venue in on a farm or you're doing some kind of activity with a um, uh, let's say a corn maze or uh, you pick operation where you come in and pick strawberries like my kids like to do. Um, what are the rules? What qualifies? What doesn't? And what's exempt from county zoning and what isn't? So that's pretty much the main issue in there. Jay, um, why should a non-farmer care about this bill? Because the farmers who are growing all the food that we eat and the clothes that we wear are, they need some certainty in the rules. And this is what another, in the line of issues we've had or the line of bills we've had like this, we're reducing regulations, providing clearer rules to farmers so that they can get out there and make good investments, grow their crops and uh, feed us and continue to clothe us. Well, as North Carolina continues to urbanize, as part of the challenge is the North Carolina voter population maybe not as familiar with the impact of North Carolina, not just on their daily lives, but on the economy of North Carolina. Sure. One thing that we don't talk a lot about with respect to the North Carolina economy is agriculture is the number one industry. It's an $84 billion industry when you start with the farm gate, then the manufacturing that goes into it, distribution, et cetera. So it's, it's the driver of our economy, and farmers play a huge role in that process. And so we need to have uh, good laws to help them do that. Uh, Commissioner Troxler likes to say, you can't do anything about the weather or commodity prices, but you can do something about government policy. It needs to be really good uh, for farmers to be able to do their jobs. Did you get everything you wanted out of this bill? Uh, I think it's a really good bill. Uh, we, we certainly didn't get everything we wanted, but um, Senator Jackson... What, what uh, is it that you did not get? Uh, let's, I don't know exactly if I can go into all the details of what we didn't get. They may be coming up later. We'll see. But uh, we think it's a good bill and glad to see it move forward. Well, interesting in Washington this week, Corey, was some talk about Dodd-Frank, the regulations that were promulgated by Congress in the aftermath of the financial crisis of a few years ago. W what are some of the changes taking place in terms of that legislation and the impact on North Carolina? Well, in the House and moving through the House was the Financial Choice Act. And that was an important piece of legislation to get started because it rolls back on wines some of the regulatory issues in Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank over the years as frankly was a bad response to a bad situation. Piling on more regulation does not necessarily make something more safe. And so what Dodd-Frank did over the years, it uh, made credit and consumer credit or uh, borrowing money from banks less and less available to normal, normal consumers and small businesses because of the compliance costs huge, huge compliance costs in this matter for banks. Large banks can absorb the cost. Small regional banks or community banks simply can't absorb that cost. And so banks have been going out of business. There's been mergers and acquisitions going on. And so what, what you had was that business going to large banks, making the large banks even larger, which was not something that Dodd-Frank wanted to do. So it was an unintended consequence of the legislation. The last part, I agree with you, Corey, <clears throat> that I think uh, one of the big issues with Dodd-Frank when it was implemented was to make sure that um, there is some way just not to have these humongous banks getting bigger and bigger. Well, that actually did not change. In right. fact, it probably got a little worse mm -hmm. um, over time. However, there is a critical element in Dodd-Frank <clears throat> that I believe is um, very important for consumers. Mm -hmm to understand because, let's face it, it banks have not been hurting since uh, right. the post-recession. Right. Um, 
I think what, what, what the consumers need to really see is if the banks are able to open their wallets to loans and make these um, big CNI, the commercial and industrial loans, and maybe mortgages. And, and I think from that perspective, having some sort of a regulatory format, Dodd-Frank, maybe some elements of Dodd-Frank did make sense. Mm. In fact, a lot of sense. Um, but others, they probably need to go away. Is the, is the implications for North Carolina, because we have such a significant banking presence here, principally in Charlotte, although I saw recently Charlotte's now slipped a third yeah. in terms of total banking presence in right. the country behind New York and San Francisco. Right. Is it specifically impacting North Carolina banks? Well, certainly so. I mean, I attended a, a, a conference in Charlotte uh, about 10 days ago on banking reform reg regulation sp sponsored by the Cato Institute and Kelly King CEO of BB&T was the uh, keynote speaker there and Kelly noted that uh, that yes bankers can't be bankers banks can't bank because of this over regulation this this over compliance and so it, it's driving uh, it's driving money out of the market into these larger institutions uh, Unwinding these things will bring back, Kelly thinks, and others do too, more uh, opportunity to start smaller banks, community banks that are more responsive to people in their in their communities. And and as as Kelly noted, you know what started out uh, years ago uh, with with buying a house, for example. Okay, the paperwork he said when he started out was three pages long. Now it's 640 pages. He said that you have to fill out and 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 maneuver through the system to get a home loan. It's just it's just ridiculous. Well, also on the financial front this uh, week, the Fed announced they're increasing the rates. You got to, what's the implication for the business community for seeing a slight uh, uptick in the interest rates? Oh, so you noticed, huh? <laughs> <clears throat> um, because certainly Wall Street did not yesterday, um, uh, but this week at least. Um, I think initially you're going to have uh, 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 small businesses um, have to pay a little more for loans. Um, you may see the credit cards that are tied to your prime. That probably will go up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the broader sense, I just don't see this as much of a story right now because I think everything the Fed is going to be doing in 2017 is already baked in to the market and what what, what is happening with businesses. The, the bigger concern, and I think we talked about it a little bit, is inflation. Mm -hmm. um, the Fed gets comfortable when inflation is around 2%. Right. right now, it's around 1.6%. And you cannot get let that number keep on going down. This time, I believe um, the Fed chief uh, Yellen said it was because of uh, cell phone plants. Uh, 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 two quarters ago, it was oil prices. Right. Well, there's always sort of, uh, but it is a Federal Reserve's job to make sure that, that inflation rate is in, under control because you don't want to see that number keep on going down, then we'll have a problem with corporate. Well, Jake, on the agribusiness sector, I mean, if we see increased pressure on loans and availability of capital, how significant is that to the agribusiness sector, given that commodity prices often don't reflect what the necessary costs of producing goods are? But do you see this causing some impact on your sector? I'm nowhere near an expert on the financial side of this, but one of the major issues we've heard from farmers across the state is they're having a difficult time accessing capital, and farming is a very capital-intensive business. So you have to borrow money going into your year, you pray that you have a good crop, or you don't have a hurricane, and then you pay your bills back, and that's kind of the way the economy, and at least for the, the farmer on the ground, has to deal with every year. So. I don't know all the details of how that's impacted, but if it will help farmers get more access to credit, that would be a good thing for us down the line. Well, we see other changes taking place in the economy. Principally, retail now is becoming a very different dynamic. Amazon, a twice the market capitalization of Walmart, the leading retailer in the country. So, Gata, how is this going to change the economic landscape of the state and the country? <clears throat> this is the big story that is, I think, is coming, and it's, it's going to be gradual. It's not going to be immediate. Just think about this. The amount, I, I believe in the last count, there were 13 retailers that filed for bankruptcy this year alone. I mean, these are not small ones. These are big, big um, names. Um, what happens to all the real estate that they have? What happens to the malls? What happens if people move towards Amazon, Overstock, Wayfair? What is the trend? And I think that as developers, as real estate watchers, we all have to follow that because it will affect 
every business. Um, if you think this is our only a retail problem, you're wrong. It will affect every business. Corey, what does the world look like without shopping malls? <laughs> well, you're seeing a, a, a change in, it, in the way uh, companies are producing their, their product. Uh, for, for example, um, uh, companies that are producing shoes, for example, uh, they're, they're changing their distribution model from sending to stores to actually uh, warehousing those shoes and, and fulfilling orders for other, for other re retailers, online retailers, and so on. And so you're, you're going to see a big transformation, as Sugata said, the way business not only at the, at the storefront level, but at the back end is done. And we're just beginning getting to see the tip of it. You know, and, 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 and to sort of parlay of what Corey said, the real estate is a big part of a lot of mm -hmm. economy, and North Carolina certainly. Look at Mecklenburg and Wake, what has right. happened. Look at the tax, right. tax bases. Uh, so it will hurt municipal mm -hmm. uh, authorities too, because they don't have to pay taxes they're, what they're getting from all these properties and suddenly if they're gone and all these big giant, we just uh, heard this week, um, Gander Mountain may actually uh, accelerate its closure plans, the new owner said, instead of keeping, and I think there are a couple of North Carolina stores that will close again. And then, and then you have these, these situations like in Cary, though, the Cary Mall, where Ikea is coming in to basically replace what the Cary Mall was and that you're going to see that as well. And, and that's, that, that's the good side yeah. of having IKEA because <laughs> right. it will, it, it will uh, draw traffic. But if you have all those little shops, all those mm -hmm. boutiques, and people are all going to Amazon Overstock and the next big app uh, into how they shop, uh, this is a big, big uh, uh, trend, yes. I believe, that is coming. One other, one other thing to think about in all this is as we move towards this more uh, online, uh, I guess, distribution model or Amazon, those type of things, people who are in rural parts of the state have got to have great broadband access to be able to uh, interface with that market. And so for farmers in North Carolina, we've heard a lot of complaints, well, we don't have the best network we need. We need faster internet. And those are kind of things that the policymakers and businesses are going to have to work on across the state. And I hope, hope maybe this trend will help push it that way. Panel, great discussion. Thank you so much for helping recap the news of the week. Next, on Bottom Line, we talked to two medical practitioners about the challenges they face in the business of providing medical care.